helps is helping to co-moderate. And um, Michal, who is online, also helped to organize the session. Um, our first speaker is, oh, I should also mention that we're going to do, we're going to do timekeeping. And um, when you have one minute left, I'm going to play this noise. I hope everybody online can hear that as well. Uh, and when, uh, when your time is up, I will also play that noise. So you'll hear it twice, uh, once when you have one minute to go and once at the end of your talk. Our first speaker is Kit. Everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Awesome. Hi. Um, today I'll be talking about leveraging AI and biodiversity informatics, specifically a very general um, survey of ethics, privacy, and broader impacts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to introduce myself really briefly. Uh, ironically, I am an information overload uh, researcher, and I did put this slide up, so sorry about that. But, um, <laughs> but I am uh, in the Technical Architecture Group, the Outreach and Communications Committee here, and I am also um, on the Program Committee and a part of the Mapping Between Standards. I'm a PhD student in my second year at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm in a dual program where I study in, um, information science, mainly looking at human-computer interaction. And I also study um, complex system science and North American Firefly Biodiversity in the Biofrontiers Institute. Next slide, please. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd like to um, acknowledge the land that I do this research on. I am at the University of Colorado Boulder which is Colorado's flagship university, and it honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous people in our state. Um, we also acknowledge that it is located on traditional territories and ancestral homes of Cheyenne, Arapaho, you and many other native nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. If you would like to know more about what we are doing, um, I included a link here and I'd be happy to share that with anyone. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I do just wanna say, uh, please take care of yourself during this talk. I will um, be covering a little bit of sensitive topics, including um, mental illness, racism, discrimination, and oppression. So with that being said, um, let's jump right in. So AI is here to stay, at least for the time being. I'm not an oracle, so maybe in a thousand years it'll be gone. I'm not sure. Um, but this, like I said, is a survey of experiments and uh, literature illustrating impacts of AI as observed in the field of information science and more specifically human computer interaction. I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible and as concise as possibly. But um, I will also be communicating some foundational concepts. So I apologize if some of this may seem elementary, um, but I don't want to be remiss and leave anything out. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a short one. Um, sorry, next slide. Perfect. Um, so the first thing that we've really encountered a lot in human computer interaction is this idea of privacy and trusting um, model ingestion. So uh, Open API, OpenAI's API does state that you will have um, privacy and it will not be ingested into their model. I I don't want to like harp on OpenAI. I actually use their products all the time and I really like them. Um, but there's not a lot of documentation on how these third party um, security assessments are done. There's no peer reviewed journals. It's just kind of a mention on their website. So specifically um, in my lab, we deal with uh, teens with bipolar disorder. So we want to make sure that that sensitive uh, information is not being sent out to the community. And I know that in biodiversity informatics, we also use sensitive information that uh, may have an NDA attached to it. And we want to make sure that we are protecting that information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, OK, so ethics and reliability. This is specifically for generative AI. I do want to give a disclaimer that I did do this in uh, ChatGPT 3.5. Um, and what I did is a series of experiments. I'm only going to share, I think, three of them here. And the first thing that um, can kind of be a touchy subject with generative AI, especially associated with people, is very nuanced information or very specific information. So what I did here is I asked ChatGPT to describe my advisor to me. 
And I was like, oh, that actually looks pretty good. That, that seems pretty legit. And I went back to Steve, um, Stephen Voida, who's my advisor. And I was like, hey, Steve, like, this looks good to me. Can you kind of explain what you think? And he's like, oh, this is pretty good. But um, his wife is also a human computer interaction scholar. And she um, is in the same department, got her degree from the same um, university as him. And it is actually attributing some of Amy's work to Steve in this ChatGBT query. So that is something to kind of think about and think about limitations of the model and relying on it. Um, the next one that I did, uh, which is kind of sad for me, I asked ChatGPT about myself and it said, I don't know who you are. And I like tried all these different things. I was like, Kristen Lewis, Kristen Lewis, born 1996. And it just kept saying, I'm an AI model. I don't really know um, who this person is. And I cannot account for all of the information in the world. And I was like, thank you for saying that. This still hurts my pride a lot, but um, thank you. And, um, oh, sorry, next slide. I was just going right ahead. Next slide. So this is uh, what I got. Oh, sorry, back one, back one. Um, this is what I got when I asked about myself. And this like kind of brings up an interesting problem when it comes to these large language models is they typically um, are very reward driven and they're not evil. I have like a very neutral stance on AI. I think it's a tool like anything else that needs to be used in its scope and appropriately. Um, but it is just trying to find the most accurate information based on what it has been told before and the reward that it gets from optimization. So basically, this is a folk theory. This is There's not really a lot of empirical evidence outside of the um, test that I did here. But basically, we could run the risk of not having newer researchers um, or less known researchers or even citizen scientists included um, in this narrative if we don't, um, well, if we rely solely on generative AI as a source of truth and a source of knowledge. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so one thing that I do really appreciate about OpenAI um, is its, its model is not transparent, but it does try to at least be transparent that its model is not transparent. So this poses the question, I asked it to, um, I asked it to describe the Kuramoto model to me. I work in a physics lab. I'm not a physicist. So one thing I really love using AI for, especially um, ChatGPT, is I ask it to explain physics concepts to a second grader, and then a fifth grader, and then an eighth grader, and then a college student. And from that, I can be like, OK, I think I understand what's going on. So after doing all of this, I asked ChatGPT if it could please tell me where it got its sources from. And it cannot provide any sort of citation other than that how it works, not where it's getting its information from, which I'm really glad that they do this. But also as researchers, we are required to cite our um, sources and have a bibli have bibliography. So I'm not saying that we should discount AI completely, but we do need to think of some methods or um, some policies to be sure that we are not bordering on the lines of plagiarism. Um, whether that is citing the model um, or whatever going forward. I honestly don't have a good answer for that yet. We actually, I teach a uh, class called Computation in Society where we have undergrads um, learn kind of how the tools and how they impact society. Um, it's not really a coding class. We do have them do pseudocode. But um, one of my favorite projects that we have them do is they have to generate AI art. And then they have to write whether or not they think it's plagiarism. And I will say that it is about a 50-50 split between all of the undergrads. So that is definitely something to think about. And then my last um, kind of topic that I wanted to talk about, it isn't about generative AI per se, um, because a lot of us do use machine learning and bespoke models and AI is this large juggernaut and large suite of tools. So before I get into it, though, I do want to define a couple of terms. So first and foremost, unconscious bias, so an often negative concept that um, most people are unaware that they even possess. Then algorithmic bias, which is social biases integrated into algorithms um, that may lead to discriminatory outcomes in firms and societies or institutions. Sorry, I will go really fast. So um, basically I wanna share <laughs> this one case study. Uh, there were a lot of things to choose from and I had a hard time. I actually picked one of the most simple algorithms that I could find and it is soap dispensers. 
So basically what happened, um, this is from a 2016 CHI paper, which is um, comp human computer interaction um, for computation in society. But what was noticed is these soap dispensers uh, could not det detect darker skin tones. Um, and this probably was not a premeditated harm or a premeditated um, instance, but they still need to really, people who develop algorithms need to understand their impacts, even if something is not their intentions. So the reason I bring this up is because some things that um, are seemingly small and go unnoticed uh, by a large group of people can actually have really negative impacts for other people. So um, also what was really kind of upsetting about this is there was no other option. You couldn't get soap if it did not detect you. So like there was not a manual option for it. So, um, sorry. And, sorry, one second. So, I wanted to illustrate this because very real impacts can come out of a conversation that not, does not include enough people at the table. Um, computing has been a traditionally very colonial um, uh, tradition. So, sorry, I'm getting mixed up with my words now. The timer really threw me off. Uh, <laughs> No, you're good. Uh, there's a lot more work on um, algorithmic harms. And I did cite the Gender Shade Projects and also a really awesome book called Weapons of Math Destruction. Um, so basically bias, even unconscious bias in, in people can translate to bias in AI, which leads to algorithmic harms um, with cascading impacts. And um, can we go two slides ahead? One more slide, please. Um, so basically... I know that um, this wasn't really a biodiversity talk, but I did have a purpose for sharing some of these. So moving forward together as Tadwig, as a larger consortium of science and as a global community, um, AI is a tool like any tool. It has tasks that it's well suited for and others that it's not so much suited for. I do believe that we have a responsibility, not only knowing when to use, but also making sure that we are training people on how to use it and that they have enough foundational knowledge to recognize when the tools are not getting the job done properly. Um, I know that I've reported mainly on socio-technical applications, implications of um, AI ethics and broader impacts, but I want to pose a challenge to the greater community of what algorithmic bias and harms could potentially look like when AI is leveraged in biodiversity informatics, both socially and research-wise. Um, I'm definitely more of an information scientist at this part of my career, but one area that I've actually experienced minor inclusion is in paleo data, so research-wise. When models and systems are developed, there are infrastructures that either do not um, exist or do not apply most accurately when capturing paleo specimens. And this prevents issues, this presents issues for understanding biodiversity temporally. Um, I do wanna give a couple of acknowledgements to, next slide, sorry. Uh, Casey Fiesler, uh, Christopher Carruth, Brian Simon, and Steve Boyda, and also my funding institution, which is the Information Science Department and the BioFrontiers Institute. And one more. And if you have any questions, I'm sorry, I know this went a little over. Um, please feel free to reach out to me or come find me during the conference. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kit. Um, I don't think we have any time for questions. We're going to go straight to our next speaker, who is Varta Adink. Yeah, uh, I'm Mo from uh, Naturalis Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands and also uh, coordinating the 